morning. Um, it's a pleasure to be here today. I actually thought it was a pleasure to be here until Ken spoke and said he wasn't born in 1976. <laughs> Jesus Christ. I mean, I was in a rock band. You know? <laughs> so I, I feel pretty bummed out, frankly. <laughs> so it's just a downer from that point onwards. That's all I can say. Um, I'm a physician epidemiologist, and I work in the crap world, as Howard said, of uh, translation. So um, like Helen, I'm definitely not deep in genomics, but um, I do know a lot about how we can twist and turn our database to be useful in the genomics space, and that's what I was, I think, asked to come here and speak about today, and I'm, I'm not even going to trust this thing. So uh, let me go to page down, I think. So uh, what I'd like to do is just two things in the 10 minutes that I'm here for. Uh, firstly give you some sense on how you can use payer-type data to either confirm some hunches that many of you may have uh, by things like phenocopying, and I'll show you one quick example, uh, or investigating potential uh, clinical utility for various tests. And then secondly, I'd, I would like to pose um, uh, a point around how the data or the system in which um, drugs are paid for in this country is really an interesting and scalable solution to promulgate the use of these tests where people might believe that uh, the evidence is there. So um, this is a busy slide. I'm sorry, it's the only busy slide that I have. But you know, for those of you who are curious, what is payer data and what are we talking about? I don't actually use that term. It was given to me for today's presentation. But um, in the United States, typically these are the buckets of data that are available um, within different payer uh, environments. <clears throat> and I work for Medco. We have we cover 65 million Americans for outpatient drugs. So we have all of their outpatient drug information. We carry, like Helen was describing, um, an el what we call an eligibility file, which is a, an anonymized uh, but linkable individual number for each person, including their aliases as they switch jobs and things. Um, it, with, that gives us age, gender, household relationships, comorbidities in some cases, uh, and it's, up, it's uh, updated every month so we know if someone becomes ineligible for some reason, and so therefore we wouldn't find any follow-up information. We have all their insurance information, um, all of their claims data, meaning every outpatient prescription drug that they've received for many, many years. Um, so we would know things like compliance, switching, non-persistence, dosing, duration. Um, also information about the prescriber, specialty, years since training, which may have some interest to you if you're trying to figure out who is it that's ordering these genomic tests or who isn't. Um, Medical claims, um, inpatient or outpatient with ICD-9 codes, so we know, you know, as long as it's coded, what the reason for um, uh, hospitalization or some event would be. Um, and the presence or absence of a test as long as it's coded, but not usually the value. Now, different than others at Medco, we also have some genomic information, and I'll give you a sense for that in a moment. So a structured kind of retrospective study in our world, retrospective meaning not going and approaching patients or doing an IRB type uh, informed consent. It, with our anonymized data, you could ask yourself a question for drug X. Uh, out of 10,000 people taking drug X, who got a PGX test and who didn't? If you think one of them is ready for prime time or uh, you think it's being used out there in, in the real world. And then you could ask yourself, well, on the basis of um, looking at the physician behavior, did they do something about it in those who did or didn't use the test? Uh, did they select a different drug at a different rate? Did they dose differently? Did they perhaps like in the case of hepatitis C, um, pay more attention to the duration of therapy. Uh, did the patient's behavior change? We have a study today underway uh, where we're actually providing the data back to the patient to see if they're more compliant once they know they are genetically at higher risk for uh, an adverse uh, problem, um, uh, actually a, a clinical problem. Um, is the use of a test associated possibly with an increase or decrease of emergency room visits and why? You know, there might be some hypotheses you'd have about reducing some side effect or bleeding or whatever it might be. Uh, hospitalizations, maybe the use of other tests or changes in therapy and, t and costs. So those are the kinds of things um, you can set up. I'll give you one example, uh, which you may be aware of. About three or four years ago, we had been reading the literature about clopidogrel, and at that time there had been some pharmacokinetic studies that had suggested that 30% of people uh, are either intermediate or poor metabolizers uh, with 2C19. They were not able to activate clopidogrel. Uh, that was all very interesting, but there were really no large-scale studies looking at what does all that mean. Uh, we have about a million clopidogrel users at Medco. So for us, if 300,000 of them are intermediate or poor metabolizers and not getting the benefit of the drug, we need to know about that. 
because there might be something we would recommend to them, maybe one of the newer therapies that are, have hit the market, et cetera. So we uh, went into our claims data with um, some researchers from Indiana University in this case, uh, looked at new starts of people on clopidogrel um, who had had a recent ACS event, uh, compared people who are on clopidogrel by itself for a year versus those who are taking a concomitant very potent 2C19 inhibitor for that same time window and just looked to see the MACE events, the cardiovascular endpoints, and found about a 50% uh, increased relative risk amongst those who were taking a potent 2C19 inhibitor. So, um, you know, obviously not a randomized trial, but was 17,000 patients, and we did adjust for, you know, everything on earth. Uh, and subsequent to our presentation at American Heart Association and publication, there's been about a dozen studies that are similar with different kinds of payer databases like these. Uh, that were in, uh, in JAMA from the VA, looking at the same question and coming out with somewhat similar um, odds ratios. Another question um, that I heard yesterday, was, which was around laboratory reporting back to physicians and what do they do with the reports. Uh, we did do a study with the Mayo Clinic uh, Reference Laboratory, and one of the questions we asked ourselves was, well, if, if you know, 500 or 1,000 physicians get back a report on warfarin genotyping, which says something like, you know, patients got a very high sensitivity, would they in fact reduce the dose? Or are they just gonna stick it in the chart or look at it and go, I don't know what that means, or not do anything? So here we actually linked up data on close to, I think, six or 700 patients who were genotyped with warfarin um, with their subsequent prescription claims files. And what we found was uh, really nicely a kind of a dose-dependent change in the weekly warfarin, just the way the genotypes would have suggested. So. They obviously got the report, we knew that, within three weeks of, the, of these prescriptions. Uh, and if you look at the very bottom, uh, you see the people who had very high sensitivity to warfarin had about a 17 milligram per week drop in the use of their warfarin. And at the very top, the people who needed a higher dose of warfarin, in fact, did get a higher dose of warfarin. So physicians who got the report, which was generated by the Mayo Reference Laboratory, which provided this extra layer of interpretation, uh, physicians actually did change behavior based on the report in a way that you would have expected. So I'd say, you know, some of the buckets of things then that we can look at um, are does genomic um, test information result in differences in compliance, like fear factor? You know, can you scare people based on their um, use of, or their genomic information to stay on their therapy? Because in our world, we find with most chronic meds, uh, people, about 50% of people drop off in the first year, and that's despite trying to explain to them how important it is to stay on their therapy. One little twist in the theme may be that genomic information would be that extra piece of information that scares them enough to stay on the therapy. So we're actually looking at that uh, today. Uh, I shared with you the example on physician behavior change and also examples on major clinical events and resource utilization. Lots of limitations with payer data, and we can go on to that conversation for three hours, but, um, you know, Here's just some of them for in full, disclo in full disclosure. I think the biggest one, and just in terms of from an analytic perspective, uh, in the U.S. anyway, the medical claims part, the hospitalizations and all of that, um, those get looked at and kind of fooled around with and re-adjudicated for upwards of five months, so they're not fresh the way drug data are, which are instantaneous every day. Switching gears uh, quickly. Yep, two minutes. Um, one of the big problems with promulgating testing beyond figuring out about the evidence is physician awareness of the field. We did do a 10,000 uh, physician survey with the American Medical Association a couple years ago, and these data are in press currently. Good news on the far left is that 98% of American physicians do believe the genes do relate to drugs. So that's a good thing, because if they didn't believe that, we'd really be in trouble. Um, but if you look at the arrow and the, and the bar next to the arrow, only about 10% of physicians feel they know enough to even order a test. 90% don't feel comfortable, don't remember having any training or education in genetics. So that's a real problem. And so the one solution I would throw out there that is scalable um, relates to the only part of the U.S. healthcare system that's 100% wired today, which is pharmacy. Since 1990, all 60,000 outpatient pharmacies in America have been electronically wired the same data elements being entered no matter where you go. So for the 90% of Americans who have, carry an insurance card in their wallet, if you go to Hawaii one day and New York the next, we're gonna know it. And if there's a drug-drug interaction, it pops up right on the screen with decision support rules, you know, right there to the pharmacist or to the physician if they use an e-prescribing device. Uh, what we've been doing at Medco the last few years is using that same system 
to propagate um, a rule that says, did you know there is this genomic test for this drug? You might want to consider it. The payer is paying for it. Uh, or if we have the genomic data, did you know there is a gene-drug interaction? And here it is, and warning the physician or the pharmacist about it. So this is a scalable way in this country to get on board an existing wired system with gene-drug rule sets that don't exist today for systems like this that are uh, resident in every single pharmacy in America. Of course, it's all about partnerships and collaborations, public and private. That was the point. For those of you who were not born um, <laughs> before 1980, this was <laughs> President Nixon and Elvis Presley. You laughed, but I was at a meeting about a year ago using the same slide, and a young person came up afterward and said, who are those two people? <laughs> So these are some of the folks we've been working with. I just mostly want to acknowledge the very bottom row, which is the more than 150 payers and more than 50,000 patients who have participated in one or more studies with us to date. And these are my conclusions. And I'm going to stop there and take any questions. Thank you. Fire away. So on your warfarin example, uh, what, what I'm wondering is how you get the other data besides the drug information. <clears throat> so, for example, how do you know that the phys physicians didn't change the dosing because they were doing uh, clotting times? Oh, I, well, we would have, we have the INR tests, whether they do or don't do them. So we would know if they did or didn't have an INR test between the date of their genomic test and the date of the drug change. We wouldn't know the INR time, I mean, the actual result, but we would know the presence or absence of having a test. So you know they didn't do... Correct. Um, those tests. That's right. Oh, well, I'm surprised, actually. That's great. <laughs> you know, it, it, what, what, you find in, what you find in the real world of data like this is people don't behave the way you think they do, you know, in academic settings or other places. Um, you know, the, the frequency with which INR testing is actually done is pretty infrequent after the first week or two of, of uh, warfarin therapy. It's kind of sad. But a lot of things are like that. It, when we look... <laughs> Well, theoretically, it would be, yes. Uh, you know, even if we, we went to a panel of oncologists asking them, you know, do you think for imatinib users, um, a, a reminder system on BCR able testing would be a good idea because it's in everybody's guidelines to do that a certain frequency. And they all said, no, no, we don't need to be told because we know to do it, blah, blah, blah. We looked in the data set, and, you know, 40% of the time it's not being done it, nationally. So, you know, maybe in your practice you do it, but not happening. Yep. You said under most circumstances you're not able. Oh, sorry, 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 sorry. Could you come in? Uh, so you, you manage this, but you have people you report to, um, companies and employers of various sorts. What's their level of interest in, in genetics? That's a great question. So uh, about two years ago, we actually surveyed 700 payers who represent about uh, $60 billion of prescription drug expenditures in this country. And we had them force rank a bunch of different topics. And pharmacogenomics was one on the list. It's the number two topic of interest, do you believe? So their number one is like benefit designs, co-pays, deductibles, that kind of stuff. But number two was pharmacogenomics. That beat out generics, biotech drugs, pipeline, you know, all sorts of drug-related questions. But pharmacogenomics has the payer's interest right now. They're looking at it as a, as a solution, not, as, not so much as an obstacle, but a solution to the imprecision that happens today. Could you comment on, um, M oh, sorry. I have a quick question. Um, I was interested in the, uh, the low prevalence or the, the low comfort level of physicians in, in ordering tests. And you, you're um, talking about delegating to pharmacists the, uh, the advising on the genetic testing. So for you um, specifically, and maybe more generally for, the, for this group, is, is what's the role of the medical geneticists and genetic counselors in, in all of this? And um, I think this, it's a question specifically here. It would be really interesting to hear the answer. But just in general, you know, how, how's that community, which um, has traditionally been the experts in, in counseling, um, going to interact with all this new data? Let me first say that um, there does not seem to be a natural home for who owns the communication and, and understanding around all this new science, and there needs to be. I mean, there's lots of different players in this space. We hire, and uh, we have about 30 gene genetic counselors on our staff today who talk to physicians every day. But um, 
that's not a scalable solution. There are only 2,000 of them in the country. So, you know, who should own this information and be the person communicating it? And I, I don't have a great answer for that one. Um, I've been to so many meetings where everybody says, you know, it's over there. But um, I'm not sure about the answer to that question. But we do need somebody who really owns and keeps people up to date and has a system that learns and educates people because the knowledge is moving so quickly, it's very hard for people who are in practice to keep up. Um, and by the way, I, I recognize Nixon, but I, I was wondering who that person on the right was. <laughs> um, so uh, could, could you comment on uh, Medco's uh, DNA Direct uh, company and sort of how, how you think for something that needs to scale at this, this level, does it need to be a private entity who can hire 40 people to work on this? Or can, should it be a government activity? Could you comment along those lines? Sure. Uh, we DNA Direct was a company we acquired a couple years ago. Um, we started off doing lots of studies and research and helping um, payers get access to individual tests that were related to drugs, of which there may be like 40 total. Uh, but what the payers told us was the genetic testing in general is so much bigger. You know, you know this. There's two, 3,000 genetic tests, and they wanted help um, managing all of that. So we identified a company called DNA Direct who had a sort of a system and software that helps physicians do decision support and figure out, you know, are the indications right for that given test? I mean, an example of where uh, a finding in that product in, where it's been used um, and I won't say the percent, but a surprising percent of physicians order a BCR ABLE test when what they really wanted was a BCR, BRCA1 test, and vice versa. And I'm not kidding. So you're getting a ton of leukemia tests in breast cancer people, and vice versa, because they start with B. So, um, well, it's the way it's working. I'm, I'm, I'm serious from real experience. So, you know, we do need some kind of decision support tools, and I don't know if it has to be the private sector or the public sector, but we definitely need to get ready for the future. I think we stop there and move on. You can ask me a question during the break. It's fine if you want. Thank you very much. Appreciate it.